Well, good evening, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to Emmanuel College for our annual intellectual property law lecture. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Professor Pamela Samuel Samuelson here this evening, a legal superstar. Um, she's the Richard M. Sherman Distinguished Professor of Law at Berkeley Law School and Director of Berkeley Centre of Law and Technology. But uh, she has held positions previously at the University of Pittsburgh and numerous visiting academic positions at leading schools in America, including Harvard, Columbia, Cornell, and then Toronto and Melbourne, and I think Amsterdam as well, is that right? So certainly um, extraordinarily well-connected across the, the globe and the legal faculties of the world. And she is, as, as you will know, a specialist on law and technology, um, and she's renowned for her ability to communicate with both um, sectors, which is, I think, also a rather unusual skill. Um, a panel that is very widely published in the Yale Law Journal, the uh, Columbia Law Review, the Duke Law Journal, Stanford Law Review, and many, many other publications, too numerous to mention. Um, but tonight, she's going to be talking to us about one of the most challenging questions in intellectual property law, uh, that of computer programs. Um, do they fall within copyright law, or are they really inventions comparable to patents? We hope that uh, Professor Samuelson will shed that, some light on that and many other questions, no doubt, this evening. Um, and she has said that she's delighted to take questions afterwards. So I would like to ask you to give, uh, join me in giving Professor Samuelson a very warm welcome to speak on functionality and expression in computer programs, a pragmatic approach. Thank you very much. So I, I want to start by thanking Lionel Bentley for the invitation to be here uh, tonight. Uh, uh, this lecture gives me a chance to revisit some issues that have been of interest and concern to me uh, throughout the 30 years of my career as a legal academic. Uh, and uh, I'm doing a tip of the hat also not only to him for inviting uh, me to, uh, to speak, uh, but also because I regard the book that he and Brad Sherman did, uh, The Making of Modern Intellectual Property Law, to be the best book ever written on intellectual property law, uh, probably ever will be written on intellectual property law, so thank you for that. And part of the reason why I mention that is not only is it a great book, so if you haven't read it, you should, uh, but also because uh, it was in the course of reading that book that I began to realize just how old the problem I'm interested in is and uh, how difficult it has been to resolve it over uh, uh, decade after decade after decade. And so uh, we'll be revisiting some uh, uh, English history as well as old American history as well as new stuff. Now my initial motivation actually to pick this topic uh, is that the issue about the patentability or copyrightability of aspects of computer programs is back up in the air in the United States. So um, there's a law lawsuit um, making its way through the courts uh, right now that Oracle brought against Google. Uh, the reason uh, that uh, Oracle sued uh, Google is because the Android platform software that many of you may have on your mobile devices uh, is, uh, uses 37 of the 166 packages of the Java APIs uh, and the question about whether or not there is infringement is a question about whether the Java API packages are protectable by copyright law uh, and that uh, question was decided by a district court judge saying, no, that's not copyright protectable. Uh, the Federal Circuit uh, reversed that decision uh, and now the Supreme Court has the case pending before it and the Supreme Court has asked the Solicitor General of the United States uh, to uh, consider whether to, uh, to take the case uh, that makes it actually 46 times more likely uh, that the court will take the case. Uh, and so it is something to be watched for. Uh, the SG will probably weigh in sometime 
in April or May, uh, so the case won't be on the Supreme Court's calendar until next uh, fall. But one of the reasons why this was a good uh, topic for uh, exploring this old question about functionality and expression, uh, copyright or patent, is because one of the arguments that Google has been making is that Java APIs should be protectable by patent law, not by copyright law. Uh, and um, the uh, Federal Circuit has said, well, just because it's copyrightable doesn't mean it's, not, it's uh, not patentable, and just because it's patentable doesn't mean it's not copyrightable, so it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and some of us are not entirely satisfied uh, with that set of Federal Circuit um, point of view. Uh, but the court viewed the kind of the argument that the API should be patented rather than copyrighted uh, as an effort of Google trying to rip the copyright protection out from under uh, Oracle um, for the uh, APIs that uh, Sun created years ago. Now, application program interfaces uh, are um, intellectual creations uh, that uh, software developers carefully engineered to set the terms on which information is going to be exchanged across the boundary of one program to another uh, in order to enable them to interoperate effectively. Um, I found it helpful to analogize interfaces of computer programs to the precise configuration uh, that a plug has to have in order to fit into a socket in order to interoperate with the electrical grid. You want the electricity to flow, you want the boundary uh, to be broken, you basically have to conform to that precise configuration. Uh, APIs are sometimes printed in a specification document uh, and sometimes embedded in software code. Uh, but APIs really are a fundamental part of what computer programs are about. Now Sun, before it was acquired, its assets were acquired by, uh, by Oracle uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so Sun had created these Java technologies, including a set of APIs. Uh, and the idea behind Java was that you'd be able to write a program that would basically, uh, you could write it once and it would run everywhere, right? That's uh, at least at the time when we were looking at, uh, at PCs and uh, servers, uh, there was this idea that we want to break out from the kind of Microsoft proprietary technology and be able to uh, essentially not have to rewrite programs every time. And the APIs that uh, were created for that were actually something that uh, was an important component of the uh, uh, aspiration to be able to do this kind of write once run anywhere. And uh, Sun, it must be said, was one of the foremost proponents of all the companies uh, in the United States and indeed the world um, saying that uh, people should be free to re-implement uh, in independently written code, uh, APIs that are uh, developed by uh, whoever. Uh, so the Java APIs, as I said, uh, consisted of 166 packages. Each of the packages is hierarchically uh, organized so that there are a set of classes uh, below that and a set of methods that are below that in the hierarchical structure. And I thought it would be helpful to give you just an example of what um, what kind of uh, Java um, uh, declaration or method header uh, is involved in the case. So there are roughly 6,000 to 7,000 uh, method headers or declarations uh, that are specifications for, uh, for Java programming. Uh, and uh, this is the example uh, where the package uh, is Java Lang. Uh, the, the class is math and the, uh, and the method is basically to uh, compare two numbers and decide which one is bigger than the other. So this is the specification uh, that Java uh, prescribes for um, uh, achieving that. So the Java command uh, here calls for carrying out this mathematical operation uh, and the line of code here um, essentially kind of is a more concise uh, uh, expression of that, uh, of that mathematical method. But the method is carried out by 
code uh, that, is, uh, that, uh, that implements this uh, more precisely. Now the question is, is something like the method header we just looked at, the command we just looked at, um, is that copyright subject matter, patent subject matter, both, or neither? Um, and it is a bit of a puzzle because if you look at sort of the selection and arrangement of words and symbols, it looks more like copyright subject matter than it looks like uh, patent subject matter. But the truth is that the, uh, there are quite a few uh, API innovations that have been patented and so it's not entirely outside the bounds of the patent system seemingly if patent offices are issuing patents on these kinds of designs. Uh, and uh, the trial court found that, the, that Google had written its own implementation code for carrying out these methods and so uh, there was at the least at the, at the trial court's view of this uh, no literal infringement. The question was whether or not re-implementing the structure, sequence, and organization of the APIs was uh, copyright infringement or not. So uh, that's the kind of deep question. Uh, and now I'll kind of go into a little bit of background. I'm not going to talk about the copyright and patent paradigms. We both know, or we all know, that the patent system uh, requires you to apply it, you have to have novelty and some sort of uh, invention uh, to qualify for it. Uh, and if you get protection, you don't get protection forever, you only get uh, for a relatively limited time by comparison with copyright. Uh, of course, copyright provides uh, um, automatic protection um, uh, for authors of literary uh, and artistic works that meet the originality standard, but it lasts a really, really, really long time. So uh, the concern about patent and copyright um, overlapping is an old problem. Uh, but of course, it's the uh, it's been a kind of convention that there's kind of like patent subject matter over here and copyright subject matter over here, and they don't they don't have any blurry lines when in fact they do have blurry lines. Uh, but, uh, but that paradigm of separability in some sense of, uh, of inventions and uh, artistic and literary works is embedded in the US Constitution, uh, which I show you here. So um, it's this clause is often uh, understood in the United States as essentially being two clauses in one, right? One granting Congress the power to promote the progress of science by granting to authors exclusive rights for limited times in their writings. And the second clause is the one uh, that says that Congress has the power to promote the, uh, the progress of useful arts by granting to inventors exclusive rights uh, for limited times in their discoveries uh, in the useful arts. So I've bolded uh, and italicized the words to just try to emphasize it, but notice that word respective, right? The word respective basically says, oh, it's over here and oh, it's over there and what do you do when something has a little blurry stuff in the middle? Uh, so the question first came up in uh, the United States uh, in the Baker v. Selden case back in 1880. So Selden had developed a new bookkeeping method and he published a little pamphlet about it. It had a little bit of explanatory text at the beginning, uh, but mostly the, the, the book, such as it was, uh, consisted of a series of forms and he kind of put in a few kind of sample entries to give you kind of an idea about how to, how to enter data in it. Uh, Baker came along later and published a book and had forms in his book that were substantially similar to the forms in the, uh, in the Selden book. Uh, and Selden's <laughs> widow then sued uh, Baker for copyright infringement. And interestingly enough, I know this because I read the entire Supreme Court record, um, that, um, uh, that uh, Selden claimed copyright protection not only in the book, but also separately copyright protection in the bookkeeping system. 
so the court was then, the Supreme Court, uh, was faced with the question about whether or not uh, the scope of copyright protection in the Selden book extended to the system or whether there was separate copyright protection in the system and the Supreme Court said no. So the Supreme Court uh, uh, came upon this, I think, partly because in the preface to Selden's book, he actually mentions that he sought a patent for the bookkeeping method. Apparently, he hadn't gotten one. Uh, but I think that ended up being very influential on what the Supreme Court uh, had to say in this case. So uh, the court was very clear that the copyright in Selden's book protected his explanation of the system, but did not extend to the system itself. The bookkeeping system itself was, in the court's view, a useful art, uh, which was protectable, if at all, by the patent system, not by the copyright system. And the court used a number of examples uh, to kind of illustrate why nobody in their right mind would think that if you wrote a book about how to treat a particular disease with a medicine, or if you wrote a book about how to plow, how to write a new, you know make a new plow that will kind of cause the you know the um, farming to be more efficient, nobody would think that you get copyright protection for the plow or for the medicine. Um, and so, if you can't get copyright protection for the plow or the medicine, you can't get it for the useful art of bookkeeping uh, either. Uh, and so, uh, that's uh, one of the important things that the court had to say about this. Uh, and uh, the sort of the Supreme Court has some pretty strong language in there that it would be a, a surprise and a fraud on the public uh, if you allowed someone like Selden to get uh, through copyright a longer period of protection than they would get uh, if in fact he'd been able to get the patent that he tried to get. Uh, but notice that the way that this is framed is really this kind of, um, this kind of uh, what I call a kind of categorical exclusivity approach, which is like something's either protectable by copyright or it's protectable by patent, but never the twain shall meet. Those, the, the subject matters are entirely uh, separate. Uh, and uh, we find that very similar things showed up uh, around the same time in, uh, in England. So the Davis versus Committee case uh, was a case involving the face of a barometer. Uh, a barometer. So uh, even though there was a registration with the, the stationery company, the, uh, the court, when faced with an infringement claim, said, no, it's an integral part of a machine. It's not really, uh, it's not really artistic or literary work. Um, and it kind of, too, adopted this kind of like inventions of inventors and uh, literary works and authorship are kind of distinct uh, types of uh, regimes. Uh, there is also an old English case that cites to Baker v. Selden uh, and um, uh, re re refers to it in part uh, as saying that this kind of the dress pattern was a mechanical contrivance that was, un, uh, was ineligible uh, for copyright protection. Now categorical exclusivity was kind of like part of the Baker v. Selden tradition until a case called Mazur v. Stein. And this is uh, a place where um, uh, the American story uh, has its own little flavor. Uh, so uh, Stein was a guy who uh, uh, created a statuette of a Balinese dancer. Um, and used it as uh, the kind of the base of a lamp and then put the lampshade, you know, kind of st strung wire up the center, put a little thing on the top and then had a, uh, had a lampshade uh, on it. But the Balinese dancer was the, uh, was a, uh, initially a statuette um, and so he registered the statuette with the copyright office. But uh, Mazur is like, so, oh man, that, that, that that Balinese dancer lamp is really selling well, I want to copy it. So uh, he went ahead and copied it and said, look, there are lots of lamp-based designs that have been protected by design patent law. So under the kind of Baker v. Selden exclusivity approach, uh, it shouldn't be a copyright subject matter. And I think actually at the time, uh, the sense of many American uh, commentators was 
yeah, that's probably right. Uh, but, um, and part of the reason for that is, again, to get a design patent, uh, the design had to be novel and non-obvious, and you had to apply for a patent just like with utility patents. Uh, and since Stein hadn't applied, the, arg the design was arguably uh, in the public domain. Uh, and so, what to do? Well, the Copyright Office, as it happens, had been issuing uh, registration certificates to works of artistic craftsmanship for quite a few years and considered that the uh, statuette that Stein registered was one of the things that fit that category. So it was okay. And here the Supreme Court says, just because something's patentable doesn't mean it's copyrightable. Um, uh, that being kind of true for something where you could sort of say there is a bit of subject matter overlap between design patents and copyrights uh, in respect of things like this uh, statuette. Uh, but I think the kind of core ruling of Baker uh, v. Stel Selden was still uh, intact because the court wasn't talking about copyright and utility patent. There's never been uh, something in the United States that's been protected by both of those things at the same time. Uh, so um, uh, categorical exclusivity has lived on in the minds of many Americans uh, since then. Now part of what we know is that uh, the, the laws in England and also in the United States provide some tools, right, with which to manage the boundaries between patents and copyrights um, in the U.S. and between, uh, and between um, copyright and design rights uh, in the U.K. And so I wanted to kind of just mention a couple of them. So unlike uh, the UK, the United States basically says that if there is any functionality of a, uh, of a, des of a pictorial, sculptural, and graphic work that cannot be separated this, the, from the kind of the, the way in which it either displays appearance or conveys information, right? If there's any integration of functionality and expression <coughs> in a pictorial, sculptural, and graphic work, the whole thing is unprotectable by copyright law. So furniture, um, uh, all kinds of designs that actually might be eligible for copyright protection in the UK, um, those things are ineligible for, completely ineligible for protection uh, under uh, US uh, copyright law. And we have um, a, a separate statutory provision that basically says that the copyright in a drawing of a functional design doesn't mean you get copyright protection for the functional design. The drawing is protected as a drawing uh, and the functional design can be re-implemented. So there's an old case um, in which somebody drew a design for a parachute. The United States government started making parachutes like that. Um, the guy sued for copyright infringement and the court said no. It's basically uh, under the, the, the kind of the penumbra of the Baker v. Selden case, it was ineligible for protection. The, in 1976, Congress added a particular provision intending to, for that provision, to kind of help to manage the boundary between uh, copyrights and patents, and that's section 102B, which reads uh, that in no case does copyright protection for an original work of authorship extend to any idea, procedure, process, system, method of operation, concept, principle, or discovery, regardless of how it's embodied in the work. Now I've highlighted, I bolded here, the words that I'm interested in because I don't know what those words mean in relation to computer programs, although I do know that Congress added those words to the statute for the specific purpose of making sure that the scope of copyright protection in computer programs would not be too broad. Um, so that's what they said at the time that they adopted it. Uh, there's also a concept, again, not one I think that uh, you find in UK law that it's called the merger doctrine where the notion is that if an idea can be expressed in essentially only one or a very small number of ways, uh, it's not eligible for copyright protection because the concern about not protecting ideas is so strong 
that even if there is some expression that's intermingled with it, uh, you don't protect it at all. Um, and there's a question, a very big debate, and it's core to what's going on in the Oracle v. Google case about whether or not merger means only that when you're first trying to create something, is there any other way to do it? If there's no other way to do it, then there's merger. Or is it the case that something could be creative at the time that you made it, but constrain the design decisions of subsequent people in a way that makes it capable of merger in the long run? I'll give you examples of that as we, uh, as we move uh, through this, but that's, the, that's one of the big debate issues. Uh, now, um, again, uh, you know these rules better than I do, uh, but uh, I think that uh, it's interesting that, that the UK, too, had a kind of categorical exclusivity uh, between designs and copyrights for a period of time. Then it shifted to uh, uh, creating a kind of defense for certain kinds of, uh, 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 for certain kinds of designs. Uh, but as it turned out, the, the unregistered functional designs ended up being eligible for full copyright protection for a time, and so screws and exhaust pipes were protected by copyright law, and that just didn't seem like an artistic or literary work uh, that we wanted to use copyright for. Uh, so there were a set of reforms, uh, and uh, over lunch today, Lionel tells me that Section 52 is slated at some point for extinction, uh, but <laughs> too bad for that. Um, uh, but, um, uh, that. But I'm just noticing that there, that there are some similarities between the tools that are part of the UK tradition and the tools uh, in the US tradition. I think Section 51, for example, is pretty similar to Section 113B that I talked about a little while ago. Okay, so let's get back to computer programs uh, for uh, a minute, or three. Um, so, yeah, source code, listings of computer programs, literary works, no problem. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they initially seemed uh, to be eligible for copyright, although back in 1964, the US Copyright Office initially issued registration certificates under what it called its rule of doubt, like, I'm not really sure that computer programs are really copyrightable, but I'll give you a certificate, and if you want to sue somebody from, for infringement, you can, but we're not saying it's really copyrightable. Now, that's kind of weird, but that's one of the things that they thought. And why did they think that? It was because in executable form, computer programs are machine processes. They're virtual machines. They're machines that are constructed in, uh, in text. And so uh, it seemed like that's not eligible for, uh, for copyright protection, but notwithstanding, uh, that reservation, eventually Congress decided to treat uh, the executable forms of programs the same way as the uh, printed uh, source uh, uh, code versions. And of course, uh, as you all know, the software directive and the TRIPS agreement embody the same norm that copyright is uh, available to computer programs as literary works. Um, but again, the question about what the, these words of exclusion mean is a kind of up for debate, just like the provisions in the software directive about uh, to the extent that interfaces, logic, and algorithms are ideas or principles, they're not protected by copyright law either. Well, what does that exactly mean? Um, so it's a similar kind of uh, puzzle. Uh, and the question about whether or not there's a rule for pads to play in protecting software is kind of up in the air too. Now, <coughs> pads have had a really complicated pattern uh, in the United States. And at the time of cases that I'm going to be talking about in a minute um, were um, were being decided from the 60s to the kind of mid to late 80s, the general view was that you couldn't get cop uh, patent protection for computer programs or uh, elements of computer programs such as algorithms that, um, uh, that might be 
uh, innovative, but uh, uh, were ineligible uh, on one or another grounds. And sort of the, um, a guy named Benson came up with an algorithm for transforming binary coded decimals to pure binary form. Uh, Supreme Court in 1972 said that's not protectable by patent law. That's basically a mental process or an abstract idea. Uh, and so, you know, there was this kind of like no patents available for a very long time. But from uh, the early 19 or late 1980s through the mid 2000s, you found the Federal Circuit uh, essentially uh, granting ever broader scope of protection uh, for computer programs. Uh, essentially, everything under the sun uh, made by humans was considered patentable subject matter for that period of time. And hundreds of thousands of software patents uh, were issued uh, during that period of time. Uh, and um, one of the things that's happened since this kind of the rise of patents kind of in that period of time is that courts in the second wave of decisions said, oh, copyright doesn't have to be that broad because there's a role for patent to play in protecting certain aspects of software. Uh, and so here are the main cases. So uh, again, in the era before the rise of software patents, uh, you had three main uh, cases uh, that, um, that took a pretty broad perspective about uh, copyright protection for computer programs. So in the Apple versus Franklin case, uh, the court decided that exact copying of operating system program code was an infringement. That was actually not so bad, but one of the things that the court said in that case uh, is that, um, that you may want to become compatible with another machine or with another operating system or with another program, but that's just a competitive objective. It doesn't, it's completely irrelevant to the scope of copyright protection in computer programs. And so seem to be signaling that um, if you copy the interface of a program to interoperate, that that might be copyright infringement too. Uh, the Whalen versus Jaslow case was uh, the kind of high watermark of protection, uh, at least until the Oracle v. Google decision by the Federal Circuit, um, where the uh, guy uh, who was a dental laboratory um, um, self-taught programmer re-implemented um, a program that he'd hired somebody else to do um, because he didn't like her, I think, anymore. Um, and he wanted to write it for an IBM uh, PC. Anyway, he copied the sum of the structure, sequence, and organization of uh, uh, the, uh, the internal design of the program and some subroutines. Uh, and the court decided uh, that copying of SSO, whether it's the way subroutines uh, operate or whether it's the internal design, what like file structures, data structures, and the like, um, that that was uh, copyright infringement unless there's only one way to perform a function. If there's only one way to perform it, then uh, that's, uh, un uh, that's unprotectable. That's a case of merger of idea and expression. But Whalen took the view that only the, the only unprotectable idea in a program was its general purpose or function. So all of a sudden computer programs are going to have way more copyright protection than any other kind of work in the whole universe. And that sort of seemed a little wrong to some of us who were commenting at the time. The Lotus v. Paperback decision was, um, uh, Paperback was a company that made a uh, kind of what they called a work-alike program to Lotus's one, two, three spreadsheet program um, and, um, and the, copied the command hierarchy of the spreadsheet program uh, was held as an infringer. In all three of these cases, the courts basically said, look, this, uh, this provision about uh, no copyright protection for process, procedure, system, method of operation, it's just nothing more than a restatement of the idea expression distinction. And we can't take it literally because if we do, then computer programs wouldn't be protectable at all. And so let's just uh, uh, say that it doesn't mean anything. Now there was a case in 1992 that turned the tide 
called Computer Associates uh, v. Altai um, by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and it turned the tide in a number of ways. So one was it recognized the functionality of computer programs and recognized that the functionality of computer programs meant that there should be a limited scope of protection for, uh, a, for the internal design elements of computer programs. It recognized that Section 102B was about trying to stop copyright protection for functionality. Uh, of programs and said that, you know, if somebody had uh, had adopted, uh, for example, a kind of a, a highly efficient way of doing something in a computer program, we shouldn't use copyright protection to uh, allow that person to fence off that most efficient way to do something. Uh, so on a kind of merger-like analysis, the efficient design uh, then is uh, available for re-implementation uh, by other um, uh, companies. Uh, and uh, court recognized that the, uh, that the, uh, that there were constraints that might be imposed on subsequent programmers, either by the hardware with which they were trying to uh, work or the software with which they had to interoperate. And so compatibility considerations uh, under Computer Associates v. Altai uh, meant that there was uh, not as much copy, not, a, not as broad a scope of protection. And the court basically threw out this notion of SSO, a structure, sequence, and organization, saying it's just not helpful. Yes, some non-literal elements of computer programs may be protectable by copyright law, but SSO is basically not a very useful way of trying to do it. The court also kind of recognized that copyright for software was kind of weird. It was really hard to apply. Um, and so uh, one of the things that it also said is maybe some of the aspects of programs should be protected by patents, not by copyrights. Or if there was a gap in protection, maybe Congress should do something about it rather than trying to stretch copyright to reach something that it wasn't intended to do. Uh, the Sega v. Accolade case was a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case out in California. Uh, that uh, was the first case to uh, recognize uh, that uh, reverse engineering of a computer program for a purpose such as getting access to the information necessary to write a program that would interoperate with uh, an existing platform uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, not copyright infringement. We call it fair use. You have a decompilation privilege that allows you to do something similar. Uh, but importantly, the Court of Appeals in that decision talked about the Sega interface uh, that Accolade essentially extracted from the code that it reverse engineered uh, as an unprotectable procedure under Section 102B and moreover said, Sega, you are trying to get patent-like protection through copyright, and we're not going to let you do that. Congress chose not to protect these kind of aspects of programs, uh, and uh, so, uh, so there. Uh, Lotus v. Borland is the last in the series of uh, kind of cases of part of the, uh, that are part of the second wave. Um, Borland, uh, like paperback, uh, made a program that allowed people who had constructed macros, little programs of common sequences of functions that they did on a regular basis. You could like do one macro stroke and have that series of things uh, uh, essentially uh, executed. Uh, and Borland had both what they called a native interface. So if you hadn't ever used Lotus 1, 2, 3, we think this is a better user interface, you should use that. But if you've been using Lotus uh, and you've constructed macros, and it will help you decide to come over to the Borland Better program um, if you can re-execute your macros. Um, so the, the emulation interface then presented exactly the same commands in exactly the same order uh, as uh, in Lotus 1, 2, 3. And the reason for that was because you can't execute the macros unless the um, unless the thing is in exactly the same uh, in the exactly the same order. Now Lotus basically said, "Hey, 
The command hierarchy is part of the structure, sequence, and organization of the program. And under Whalen versus Jaslow, in cases like that, it's a protectable part of the program. Uh, and there's no merger of idea and expression because, hey, when we set out Lotus initially, we could organize the commands whatever way we wanted. So, you know, the fact that Borland had its own native interface shows you don't have to use the same stuff. Uh, Borland's argument was that the, the, uh, the commands had to be in exactly that order in order for the macros to execute. And therefore, there was a kind of merger of idea and expression, or there was a kind of system, right? The macros were a system so that things had to be in this particular order. So the fact that it might have had a chance, uh, had a choice initially, is irrelevant because the people who have invested in creating macros want to be able to use those macros. You shouldn't have to learn how to write macros all over again. It's part of the macro system and therefore ineligible for protection under Section 102B. First Circuit Court of Appeals um, uh, ended up deciding that the command hierarchy of Lotus 123 was a method of operating a spreadsheet program uh, to fulfill some functions, and so it was unprotectable under Section 102B. <laughs> kind of likened it to the buttons on a VCR machine. Um, just more buttons, but um, essentially the same kind of idea. Uh, and so uh, Lotus appealed that case to the Supreme Court. Uh, after hearing oral argument on the case, the court split four to four. Uh, and so kind of left the question about whether a command structure uh, of a computer program uh, is part of what's um, protectable by copyright law or not. One of the things that Borland argued during that case uh, was that command hierarchies and macro systems are patent subject matter. They found patents that had issued for some of these things uh, and so made the argument that it was uh, uh, ineligible under Baker v. Selden for copyright protection. Now, uh, a very similar case actually uh, came uh, up in the uh, UK High Court, uh, uh, got referred to the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, the kind of the, obviously the legal context is a little bit different, but uh, there were, um, so one of the main sort of defenses here was that users of the SAS statistical analysis program had written these little mini programs, like the macros, these were called scripts, and they were like common sequences of statistical methods that you, that you went you know, on, to do on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and so people wanted to be able to use their scripts if they were gonna port them, if they were gonna be able to use another program, they wanted to like take the investment that they made here and be able to run them over here. So uh, WPL essentially re-implemented the functionality uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, SAS statistical analysis program uh, and um, uh, the court decided that the functional behavior of a program, uh, that is to say, Right? The fact that you're emulating a functionality of another program, that's not copyright infringement. Uh, the scripts had a little language, just like the macro language, uh, and uh, the, the script language uh, was not protectable by copyright law uh, in the EU, EU, and neither were the data formats. Uh, all of them were unprotectable ideas under the software directive. Uh, and uh, Mr. Justice Arnold referred these questions, this and other questions to um, the CJEU, which basically agreed with him on those issues. And I have the honor of having uh, co-authored a paper with uh, Professor Cornish on this particular case. Um, the result actually comes out to be almost the same. Uh, the, the legal issues are very similar uh, to uh, the um, uh, to the Lotus v. Borland ruling, and that was actually one of the arguments we were making. Let's try to have a compatible um, uh, legal idea. Um, one thing that's actually worth mentioning is that the Court of Justice of the European Union actually invoked the TRIPS agreement, which talked about the unprotectability of methods of operation and, and uh, procedures as kind of a part of a basis for this. And so there is a, you know, a bit of uh, harmonization there, at least in terms of uh, TRIPS uh, kind of giving us more of a connection to each other. Uh, back to the, uh, the 
Oracle v. Google case. So you find the trial court having relying on the Altai uh, and Sega v. Ackley decisions for the propositions that trying to promote interoperability is a good thing, right? And Google said, one of the reasons that we adopted these 37 J a Java API packages so was so that uh, people could interoperate, right? So the programs that had been written in Java could run on the Android platform, and things that were written on the Android platform could run on other Java uh, systems. And the Lotus v. Borland case was important because the court said that, hey, um, these are commands just like in the uh, in the Lotus v. Borland case, and they're a, either a method of operation or, or a system, and therefore unprotectable by copyright law. Alternatively, um, the court said, look, you have to use exactly the same names for these functions in order for the Java APIs to work, um, uh, and so that's actually um, uh, an alternative basis for the decision. Uh, the court rejected the idea that this SSO, Structure, Sequence, and Organization, was uh, a way to conceptualize what computer program elements might be protected, uh, and said, you know, there's a danger of giving too broad a protection to computer programs, because that may make it a little bit too much like Pass. Now, the Federal Circuit, in its decision reversing the trial judge, uh, said, hey, at the time that Sun was first designing the Java API packages, they had lots of choices. They were really creative, and so there's no merger of idea and expression because at the time that they set out to do this in the first place, they were not under any kind of design constraints uh, based on pre existing systems. Uh, the court rejected out of hand the notion that there's a compatibility exception uh, to uh, copyright um, and um, uh, kind of puts a little dig in uh, also because instead of using all 166 uh, Java API packages, uh, Google only used 37 of them. Uh, now those 37 were selected because uh, this, the, the testimony says, uh, because uh, these would be appropriate to the use of Java on a mobile device, right? One thing to know is that Java was ori originally kind of created with the idea that it was going to run on PCs and on servers, not on um, not on mobile devices, and so uh, there was kind of an adaptation going on because of that. But um, uh, but the court uh, of appeals said, Java, you know, uh, Google intentionally designed this to be incompatible with Java, and what they were really trying to do is take a free ride on the investment that Sun and Oracle had made in getting Java adopted. There are now 6.5 million. Java programmers who use these API packages on a regular basis. They know the commands, they want to be able to use them, uh, and this is free riding by the bad guys is uh, Oracle's, I mean, is Oracle's position on that. Um, and uh, as in the earlier cases, the court saw um, 102B as being nothing but a restatement of the idea expression distinction. So uh, Google's asked for Supreme Court review uh, of, this, uh, of this case, um, making an argument that it's a case of exceptional importance for the software industry. There's a conflict among the circuits about what Section 102B means. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a split in the circuits about whether there's a compatibility uh, exception to, uh, uh, to copyright. Uh, there's um, a difference also among the circuits um, on uh, what the merger doctrine means, and they also make this argument that APIs are uh, patent, not subject uh, copyright ma uh, uh, subject matter. And um, one of the reasons the court, so when the Supreme Court takes cases, they often take them when there's a circuit split. Here you have a situation where 20 years ago, the Supreme Court split four to four on exactly the same legal issue. 
And guess what? The circuit splits have gotten deeper because the court wasn't able to resolve it back, uh, back then. So the question is what to do. So Oracle, of course, says, no, don't take it. Um, and um, uh, is very happy with the Court of Appeals uh, decision. Um, I think the patent subject matter argument is the weakest part of Google's um, uh, argument uh, up to date, um, partly because I showed you one of the Java API um, specifications. It just doesn't look patentable, okay? It looks copyright protectable, if anything. Um, in an article I wrote with a couple of other people, uh, back in 1994, a manifesto on the legal protection of computer programs, uh, we identified that a lot of the value in computer programs really comes from them being industrial compilations of applied know-how. And I see uh, something like an API or an API specification as one example of that. Uh, and uh, we made an argument that you know, you're going to either under or over protect these kinds of industrial compilations of applied know-how if you use copyright. Uh, so a sui generis form of protection would probably be a better idea, but uh, that's water under the bridge. Uh, but more, uh, more importantly, um, uh, the Supreme Court has not found categorical exclusivity to be uh, appealing since the, uh, since the Baker v. Selden case, the patents might have issued an error. Um, uh, they may be a, at a different level of abstraction. And guess what? It turns out that patents are eroding uh, now. So uh, last, uh, uh, last June, uh, in the Alice versus CLS Bank case, the Supreme Court ruled that a computer implemented method of settling financial transaction uh, risk was unpatentable subject matter. It was too abstract an idea. Uh, to be eligible for protection. Since then, <coughs> hundreds of software patents have been thrown into question and dozens of them have actually been uh, repudiated uh, as uh, ineligible uh, for, copy, uh, for patent protection altogether. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting to me is that a lot of these things are part of the structure, sequence, and organization programs. So wouldn't it be like completely weird if they're too abstract for patenting, um, and yet because they're SSO under the interpretation given in the federal circuit, they'd be eligible for copyright protection even though not for patent protection. This drives me crazy. Um, I don't think that's the, what Congress had in mind, but you never know. Anyway, part of actually what may have motivated the Federal Circuit and the ruling that they made in the Oracle v. Google case is Judge O'Malley, who wrote the decision for the Federal Circuit, actually was the, one, of the, one of the judges of the Federal Circuit who would have upheld all three types of uh, Alice's software patent claims. And I think she's worried that if the Supreme Court is kind of pulling the rug out from under uh, the patents for software, by gum, she's not going to let the copyright get gutted. Uh, and so she's basically protecting copyright for all she's worth now um, in this uh, particular decision. But of course, one of the questions that's interesting here is whether if, in fact, patents recede, should the scope of copyright expand? because now they're less protected. Okay, so I promised you um, actually um, some pragmatic approaches, so let me, let me give you two. One is a legal one and one is a kind of realistic one. Uh, so the legal one is basically, you know, we've been able in a lot, in America anyway, been able in a number of kinds of circumstances to separate functionality and expression uh, through various doctrinal and statutory mechanisms. And we should be able to do that with respect to computer programs too. Uh, so, um, you know, Supreme Court did it with Selden's forms in the explanation. Uh, Stein's lamp basis, a statuette. Um, there are a bunch of ways in which, you know, it's like architectural works are protected, but that the scope of copyright protection in architectural work doesn't extend to the wiring and the plumbing and the things that are basically conventionally um, uh, functional design elements of those. Uh, and I think in same measure, we should be able to say that program code is clearly expression, but things like algorithms, interfaces should be unprotectable. Uh, by copyright law, and part of what's happened here is that that literary work metaphor 
uh, that we use to describe computer programs, it sent us off in some weird directions, right? We recognized that functionality was present um, as in the design area that uh, UK has been uh, kind of ex dealing with some overlap, uh, then we wouldn't be quite as, uh, quite as uh, um, confused. So what's the pragmatic approach number two? Uh, so it's to recognize that copyright is doing a lot of good work uh, in protecting uh, computer programs. Uh, so mostly it's the code and those expressive parts of, uh, of, the, of a program uh, such as video game graphics uh, and, um, uh, and sound that uh, may be uh, just like a regular audiovisual work. Um, and we should keep our minds open to the possibility that some non-literal elements of programs uh, should be uh, uh, eligible for copyright protection, but let's scrutinize them a little more carefully than we've done so far uh, because many of them, perhaps most, are excludable uh, under Section 102B uh, and languages, behavior, interfaces, logic, and algorithms really should be beyond the scope of copyright protection uh, in programs. But more importantly, most of the internal design uh, elements of computer programs don't need copyright protection because they are adequately protected through trade secrecy law and through licensing. The, um, for the most part, it's really difficult and complex, um, uh, difficult and expensive uh, to reverse engineer a program to get a, to extract non-literal elements of programs. You don't do it unless you really have to. Um, and more importantly, if you ask software developers what's really important to you, how do you attain competitive advantage in the marketplace? And I've done a survey of, uh, of software entrepreneurs and I know the answer to this question. First mover advantage and complementary assets are way more important than copyright, trademark, trade secrecy, uh, let alone patents. Very few software companies in the United States um, actually get or even apply for patents. They don't really think that they're useful to them in attaining competitive advantage. So let's not worry so much about the receding of patents. That's actually not a bad thing uh, for the software. Uh, and copyright's important uh, by comparison with patents, but it's not really that important uh, as these things go, except for the protection of code. Uh, so in conclusion, we sort of see uh, that uh, patents and copyrights have a long history of trying to like essentially navigate uh, ways in which to kind of protect appropriate things, not get in each other's way. Um, uh, there are doctrinal ways to kind of get out of this. I think that APIs and command structures um, are examples of things that um, probably shouldn't be protected by either copyright or uh, by patent, although they can often be protected uh, as trade secrets. Uh, but we can get lost in the worst possible meta metaphysical muddle if we try to separate functionality and expression in programs. It will make you just completely crazy if you try to do that. Uh, so let's not drive each other crazy. Let's just drive, uh, develop a couple of, um, uh, of simple rules uh, and as a pragmatic matter, just basically relax a little bit. Um, uh, software industry is doing real good, um, and, um, but Google should win this case. Thank you. <laughs>